Welcome to Spirit Life Media, the audio-visual scripture and music ministry of Tree by the River Church. Acts 20 verse 32 says, I commend you to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance amongst the saints. God's best for you is stored up in his word to you. Therefore, this medium is God's channel to get his best across to you. Be blessed. Please be seated. Our first minister is one of the voices the Lord is raising this end time to help the church of God to find its way again. It's a great man of God and is a voice crying in the wilderness. Personally, I find it a great honor and a great privilege that he has allowed us to be a part of his ministration. We do not glorify man, we glorify the Lord. So with Jesus' joy in my heart, I invite a dear brother, one of the fathers of the faith in the last days, Reverend Mazino Ebunuku. Hallelujah. Uh, I hope you'll be able to clap like that. I don't think you heard me well. I don't think you heard me well. If you heard me, you won't clap. I said I hope you will be able to clap in five minutes. Time. I hope you'll be able to laugh in five minutes' time. Do I sound funny? Five years ago, I stood on a pulpit like this, and what I feel right now. It's a thousand times worse than what I felt then. I thought I had received messages that I was going to preach throughout this conference until yesterday. And throughout yesterday, I was locked in the house and I kept crying, God, what was happening? I was troubled, I was agitated. It doesn't always happen like this, but it does happen sometimes. I remember going to Ibadan for a program in Ibadan once. But what I feel is different. It's scary. And five years ago, right there in our church, I had a guest minister come from Liberia, he was the head of witchcraft before Jesus touched him, high priest of a very high demonic shrine before God touched him. And I remember as he was about stepping down, right on the chair, the Lord spoke to me. In essence, we're going to lose somebody. I have people here who are witnesses to that day. Somebody's going to die. That's what I heard. And so I came out and I said, I'm afraid to say what I have to say. I'm very afraid. I'm very afraid. I sat down on my chair and I kept battling. God, how can I come and say this kind of thing? This is an era of grace. How can I? And God said, go and say what I've said. So I came out and I apologized to the church as I am going to apologize to all of you today. 
I said to them, we're going to lose somebody. This was about 12 o'clock in the afternoon. By midnight that night, a young man in our church died. Very first death in the church. And it so happened that about that same midnight, when I gave that prophecy, another young lady called me to tell me, I'm the one you were talking about. I said, this person has missed God. God has been trying to get your attention. I didn't realize that his own sister, who was a pastor in another country, saw a vision of him in occultic garments. So what is going on? I will never forget what you told me in my office, because he died Sunday night or into Monday morning, and you saw me on Tuesday. You called my wife, you said, I want to see the pastor. And I saw you, because on Monday we went to pray for him. And he told me how, how they would go away from church. They wouldn't come to our church because of the message. It was easy for them to go to all the big churches where he will tell you, you will be blessed. You will be great. You will be wonderful. And you will have millions. And anybody that can say hallelujah ten times would be blessed. Because every time they came to our church, the sword of the Lord had to prick their heart. It was one of the most painful burials. Within one week, we buried him. I'm not careless about what I said because I sat with his wife and I told her. I said, the Lord has told me to share this story everywhere I go. I pray that just like the story of Ananias and Sapphira, it will not offend you. Because even if it does, I still will share it. I've shared it in front of her many times, and I will share it until the day I leave this earth. Hopefully there will be no other situation like that. I buried him within one week, I think. Within 12 hours of the prophecy, he was dead. And I said, a lady had called me that night, and we were ministering to her throughout the night, from about 12 to about 4. Because she said, she was the one that God is going to kill her. She was crying and crying. Sometimes she would drop. I think she even wanted to kill herself or something. We, we later ministered deliverance to her. But she kept my phone occupied throughout. So when his wife tried to call me to say he was having a heart attack, she couldn't reach me. So he died. Yesterday, I was praying. And my wife has been bothering me, telling me, you're very agitated. I said, I know. But I don't know why. I've been very edgy for the last two days. But I know it's attached to the message I have. I know. I didn't go anywhere yesterday. I was in the house throughout. I've been very edgy. I've been, I, I said, I don't know what is this. I didn't know. I got here today. I knew that most of what I had thought I was going to share was not what I was going to share. And I told my wife, I, this doesn't always happen. I don't know what I'm going to share. But that means there's something. Then I walked in there and I sat down. And the Lord asked me again, can you share what I want to say? And again, I'm afraid. But by the grace of God, even if you stone me, and I mean this, even if 95% of you walk out of this place, I will say what the Lord wants to say. I don't know that I can really preach today, but I know I, I will. 
have to prophesy. The Lord says, I should say to you, how many of you are 40 years and below here? Lift up your hand. 40 years below. 50 years below. 50 years below. Lift up your hand, including the 40. A generation is regarded as 50 years, going by the establishment of Israel and other scriptural things. 48 years, 50 years. I want to say to everyone who is about 50 and below that you are a bastard generation. I, I don't, it doesn't sound like a comfortable thing to say. I've been wrestling there. I'm happy that you were speaking because I don't know that I could have said what I have to say if you were not speaking because I've been wrestling and I've been trying to find this. God, what? Listen to me. Whoever is listening, all of you here, this generation. Is a bastard generation. I don't use this word. As I sat there, I was opening the scriptures. And I know what God is talking about all of a sudden. I've known. Because years ago in my private study, he has shown me. Who is a bastard? A bastard is an illegitimate child. A child that may live in a man's house but is fathered by another person. That's exactly what Jesus said in John chapter 8 verse 44 to the Jews. He said, you people say that God is your father. He said, but your father is the devil. Your father is the devil. You need to understand the, until today, until now, a few minutes ago, I did not know the enormity of what Jesus did right there. It's what's happening here. The Jews were very religious. They know all the songs you're singing, they know more than your songs. The Jews were very church people. They tied their hair. They do everything that we are doing right here. But Jesus called them, you are of your father, the devil. You are in the house of God, but God is not your father. Somebody else is fathering you, the devil. Many of you who can hear my voice, I want you to listen very carefully today. Because... Only a remnant in this generation will survive. Listen. There's a scripture in 1 Peter chapter 4. Let me start from verse 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin in the house of God. I came here thinking I was going to teach and I know why I cannot teach. I know why. Listen to me. I can come and tell you good preaching today. I can preach till you clap like you started clapping. I know nobody's going to clap when I'm out of here today. You won't clap again. You won't have time to clap for me or any other person for that matter. What is on your head is more than what many of you know. Before I go on, not, not only is your generation cursed, and I fall into that generation too, because I'm short of 50. Not only is your generation cursed, the fathers that raised this generation are judged. Let me say it again. The fathers that raised this generation, they are judged of God. These are not simple things. As I stand here, I am trepidating. I am I'm not scared, but I am 
afraid of God. The Bible says that Jesus was, he, he was afraid in Hebrews chapter 5. He feared. He didn't want to dishonor God. He feared God. I stand here, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of God. This is a bastard generation raised by fathers whom Satan has spoken through and therefore raised this generation. And just like the church that was in Sardis, there are only a few. Listen, let me tell you how this scripture has been written for generations. But never in the history of the church or of mankind has this scripture carried the weight that it carries in your generation. I will read it. 1 Peter chapter 4 from 17. For the time is come that judgment must begin in the house of God. And if it first begin with us, what shall be the end of them that do not obey the gospel of God? Look at 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? And if the righteous scarcely... Do you know the meaning of scarce? I want to sound it for everybody to hear. That scripture, I'm coming to announce by the word of the Lord, the highest manifestation in the whole span of mankind is going to be on your generation. You know, you should have not invited me. You should have just stayed peacefully. But as you have now invited me, you have to hear. I told you that 95% of you might walk out. Because many times Jesus talked. This, this is too hard. And they had to leave. Some of them can't take it. One day he told the rich man, go and sell everything. If not, you can't go to heaven. The man said, my father was a very rich man. He worked hard. And my grandfather, they handed all this to me. I should just tell all. Just like that. I start following you all around the place. It's a hard saying. This is a bastard generation. Only few will make it in this generation. And it is not altogether because of your fault, even though it is, as we are going to discover, it is the father's all through the Bible, God relies on the fathers to pass down his truth to the children. And every time the fathers allow a bastard to be raised, that is when they refuse to communicate the truth of God by which he raises his children and allows the devil to bring his truth and raise these children, even though they are in the house of God, they are bastards. It is possible, and this is what has been over the last couple of decades, I want to speak particularly for this country, Nigeria, and for many countries all over the world. There has been an apostasy. The church is no longer the church. That Jesus died to raise. Only a remnant today know their God. And the whole place is flooded with so called fathers. But they are raising bastards. So that in the scriptures, we read in Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says from verse 5, and you have forgotten. So this is where I begin to elaborate on my prophecy so that you can judge whether what I have said is of God. 
and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as children my son despise not the chastening of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him for whom the Lord loves he rebukes or he chastens and he flogs or punishes or scourges every son whom he is going to receive if you endure chastening God will deal with you as a son for which son is he whom his father does not chasten but if you be without chastisement whereof all are partakers whereof all sons are partakers then you are bastards and not sons these are not my words they are the words of god a generation that god cannot chasten is a bastard generation when i say bastard or when the scripture says bastard jesus was a little more polite than the writer of hebrews maybe it was paul we don't know 100 percent Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 from verse 21 he says many will say Lord Lord am I not your child did I not prophesy did I not go in your name as your child did I not cast out devils he will say get out you are illegitimate I didn't know you you have been fooling yourself in the house of God because another person has been raising you up in that house. You are of your father the devil. You have been in the house of God, but you are your father the devil. His lusts are your lusts. His pride is your pride. The wickedness in his heart is the wickedness in your heart. I show you a mystery, beloved. Behold, I show you a mystery. And Pastor shared with us earlier on about Jacob. I like the part most about how Jacob met God in Peniel and was transformed. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. The prophecy that came out in Romans chapter 9, verse 13, about Jacob and Esau. He says, Jacob, have I loved? This is when, before they were born. Oh. Listen, listen. Jacob, have I loved? Esau, have I hated? Before they were born. Two nations are in your womb. The older will serve the younger. Jacob, I love. Esau, I hate. He repeated it again in Malachi. He said, and I hate Esau. I hate Esau. There's something about our generation that is bringing hatred into God's heart. The difference is what Pastor read earlier on. Jacob was a chastenable soul. Esau was not. Jacob was a soul that God knew that even though he strays, he will hear my voice. This generation is not hearing God's voice. You are full of yourself because your fathers have raised you up in mammonism, in materialism, in empty vanities, in seeking the things, just like he said, that are beneath. So you don't know God. This generation doesn't know God. I wrestle with God here. God said this generation can't know me. I'm going to share something. I'm going to be more prophetic. I will teach a bit to balance what I'm trying to say. I'm telling you what I'm hearing. He says this generation can't know me. The code that has been downloaded to them from the fathers. It will take a few. A few. Who can pay the price? I'll talk about who can pay the price tomorrow. A few who can pay the price to break that code. But I'm yet to find those few. 
As I say it, I say it fearing because I'm part of them. And I say, Lord, why can't I not be part of that few? It's driving my thirst. It's driving me to go deeper. Don't be in a rush. Please. By the time this program is over, you may get something that may be truly life transforming. We may start like this, but you might end rejoicing. If you truly want to seek the Lord. If you don't, I may as well warn you, don't come again after today. But if you run away, as you go to the express road, they come and knock you and you'll be dead. Yeah, like Jonah. So it's better you stay and hear the chastening of the Lord. Because if you run away, you end up an Esau. Who does what Esau does? A profane man. He has little, you see, a, a, a profane man, he takes spiritual things for granted. They heard about God's work with Abraham, their grandfather. They knew the hand of God over Abraham. They knew the covenant of God. But Esau looked at everything as a joke. So he sold it. I beg, give me food. Give me those things that are beneath. Give me the things for my belly. Jacob said, no, there's something about that. I want to turn aside and see this site. Will you sell me your birthright? Birthright, I'll give it for cheaper. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. The faith that is passed to you by a generation of fathers. Is it the faith that can chase, the Lord can use to chase in you? When a generation keeps hearing, you are blessed, you are great. They grow up thinking this is the way of God. When a generation keeps hearing and they get used to it, the remnant of this generation will only be those who can break away from this code that the fathers have locked this generation in. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There is a code. Do you know? If you have two siblings, a brother and a sister, and this is a true story I know, and I'm your father, and for some evil reason, I call the brother, your sister, she said, don't mind her, she's a bad person, be careful, don't eat her food, she'll be poisoning you. I started hearing that from young. You, you are greater than your sister. You are the best in the world. Nobody better than you. Then I go to the sister. Your brother is a selfish man. He thinks only of himself. You are the blessed child. You are glorious. The next day something happens. I told you about your brother. Something happened. I told you about your sister. When you grow up like that, when you become a man and a woman, it will be only a miracle that can break that code of hatred that has been sown in your heart. When you grow up in a generation of lies, when you grow up in a generation where there is no chastisement, you are a bastard. When you grow up hearing a false kind of grace that tickles you and makes you think that God and Christianity is about you, not about him, you grow up to be a bastard. Why are you a bastard? Why are you an illegitimate child? Because you are growing up raised by Satan, not by God. But you don't know it. Let me show you. I, I was reading chastisement. Somebody remind me to go back to chastisement. Hebrews chapter... 12, okay? I want to go back there to finish what I'm saying, but I need to share a mystery. The Lord hit my heart. I didn't know what it was about. When we were driving, I was hearing things in my spirit. And one of the things I heard was, did Jeremiah fail? I asked somebody, please write it down for me. Did Jeremiah fail? And it was when I got to the room, I told my wife, I need two hours. I need to go to the scriptures. So I asked God, what is this meaning of these things that I'm hearing? I heard a few things. I will share them as I go on. Did Jeremiah fail? 
So I got to the room, open scriptures. And I saw. I went to the vision of Jeremiah. That's Jeremiah wanted. He said, I have called you to what? To root out, to pull down, to tear down and destroy, then to plant and to build. Let me ask you, who did Jeremiah root out? Who did Jeremiah pull down? Can I ask you? Do you know about Jeremiah's life? He reigned under two different kings. He was prophesying under two different kings of Israel. So, if God tells us before you were born, did God lie? Did you see anybody that Jeremiah pulled down? Yes. God never lied. God pulled down Israel. But it's not Israel he pulled down. He pulled down demonic kingdoms that had supplanted him themselves over Israel and destroyed Israel because they had allowed demonic kingdom. They were supposed to be raised up. I don't know if time will permit me. If you read Jeremiah from chapter 1 and 2. I have to read that. I have to teach a little bit. Jeremiah, let me do the first chapter. You can be in the house of God and before I even start telling you, Jeremiah, I want to even say, I have three things now. One, I'm going back to chastisement. Two, I'm talking about Jeremiah. But I want to tell you something to buttress this point. God deals with men from generation to generation. Go and read your whole Bible. There's a generation, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 4, that after Seth then came Enos. It was during that time that men began to seek the face of the Lord. That was the generation. Then we go down until we get down to the seventh from Adam. Enoch. And Enoch walked with God. And that's when men began. Why do we know? Because Jude tells us about Enoch. What he was preaching during that time. How he was preaching that the Lord will come with tens of thousands of his saints. Read it, it's there. We know the message of Jude. At that time, nobody cares. Your generation has been programmed not to care about God. Listen. Even though there is shouting of God, God, God. You need to understand Jeremiah. What I'm saying, everything I'm saying is what Jeremiah said. When Jeremiah came, he came to tell them, you are all cursed. Yes. Babylon is going to come and finish you people. When they come, just surrender to them. Because you have betrayed God. Because you have been murdered by a harlot and fathered by the devil. Because your pastors have been prophesying peace and safety. Because your pastors have been telling you all is well when you are all dying. Because they have let you, the priests, into vain imaginations instead of into the true pursuit of God. Hallelujah. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, What iniquity has your fathers found in me? That they have gone far from me, and they have walked after vanity and become vain. Did you hear the question? What iniquity have your father found in me? They have gone far from me. Who was he addressing? The fathers. I say this humbly today because I'm just a small boy. I say this humbly today. To the fathers, all the fathers, and not all fathers are bad. Because in many ways, I'm a small father in my own way. Because I've raised thousands. But I say this humbly. The judgment of the Lord is upon the fathers. I say this very humbly. I say it fearfully. And I say it respectfully. The judgment of God Almighty is upon the fathers. If you start that chapter, it says Israel was holiness unto the Lord. It says you chase after me. Like a man is chasing a woman. But what has happened? We are living in a time 
where your generation is primed to chase after things and not after God. And when you keep hearing the type of things, just like the brother shared with me, that whenever they come to our church there, himself and his friend who died, they will hear this type of message that will prick their hearts. Then they made their mind up they are not going to church. So they started going to some of the other big churches in Lagos. They started going to other churches. Because in those churches, they will teach you faith. So faith is a substance of hope for. And they will tell you how. You just need to name it and claim it. And you need to speak the word. It's about you, 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 you. Faith is not about you. It has never been about you. Do you know that? They will read for you Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. It says, through faith, the elders obtain a good report. And they will tell you that that good report is your testimony. It's not exactly true. Because as you read the story, as you go on, the Bible says, some of them, they were cut asunder through faith. Yes. They were cut in half by faith. Do you know that? Some of them, they refused to live again. They prefer to die because this world was not good enough for them. Some of them were beaten. Some wrought righteousness. Some subdued kingdoms. Why? Then he says, all this having had a good report didn't obtain the promise. Okay? All this having had a So, Abraham got a child. And Sarah, in their old age, that's a good report. But what of the man who was cut asunder? That they cut in half. Is that a good report? It's a good report. You know why? That good report is not for you, it's for God. They got a good report before God. That's why they were heroes of faith. Not the emptiness going on today that they got good reports. You got a testimony. I got a new car. No. Their testimony was so profound. Enoch, he walked with God. He pleased God to the point God took him away. Come on. Their testimony was too profound before God. It has been changed in our time by the fathers. It's your testimony of your car here. Except that work, testimony is working something in the pleasure of God. It is no testimony at all. Let me repeat it. Except whatever you claim to be a testimony is a part of the divine will of God that brings pleasure to his heart. That's why a lot of the testimonies being shared today is grieving God's heart because they are Potiphar's wife's testimonies. Are there not things that many who come to share they receive by sleeping with Potiphar's wife? Then they come to the church. You can fool men. You can never fool God. You can fool men. You can never fool God. And as I was saying, a generation that God cannot chasten is an Esau generation. Hatred. I'm not the one that says it. That scripture that God says, if I cannot chasten you, you are a bastard. For whom I love. It happens three times in the Bible, in the New Testament. Three times. That's how important it is. It happens three times. The one we're reading in Hebrews is the second time it actually happens. The first time it happens was a warning in 1 Corinthians and chapter 11. And in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31, 32, it was, it was us there. In 1 Corinthians and chapter 11, 31. For yeah. if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Go on, 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Are you hearing this? Verse 32 says, if we will judge ourselves, I brought a message of judgment today. Judge yourself before God judges you. I say this to the children, which is us. And I say this to the fathers, which is them. If we will judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Because the Bible says, 
when we are judged we are chastened of the lord so that we will not be condemned with the world again i repeat a generation that will not be chastened of the lord will be condemned with the world bastard generation they will say lord lord i will say get out i never knew you illegitimate generation they will be raised up in the church they will become in the church they will be church people but they will be bastard generation because they did not go and find god let me say something else as i go on it has become so dangerous because of the wickedness of most of the fathers of this generation not just in nigeria now but worldwide because of the emptiness of their messages it has become so dangerous that this our generation if we don't go in search of God for ourselves we are gone did you hear me well if you are depending on some some fathers from yonder if you don't go in search like Moses if you don't go in search like Abraham you will be condemned with this world I want to tell you today the secret of escape is chastisement Esau could not escape because he could not be chastened of the Lord he continued in the way you have to break the code that has been set on this generation the Lord began to help me break this code since 2008 in many ways the code of this generation had affected me that's why today you can see you go around our churches go around all these places praise God today we now have what you call the hyper grace brought by another group of so-called fathers over the last 50 years so you have a generation of people raised and they have minimized sin they have watered down sin they have made sin so ordinary the thing that grieves the heart of god the most so you have a generation that is now being raised that has become carefree about sin careless oh come on i have half grace they are toying with fire hallelujah god has to chasten you he has to chasten us he will bring us to the place of total submission and brokenness and he will bring us to the place of complete pursuit of him the code of the generation that we are in that is being passed down like i told you it will make you self-seeking it's a code see jesus did not come to die to make something out of you I have shared this so many times when I go around the world. And some people wonder, what are you saying? Jesus did not come to die to make something out of you. No. It's a code that has been passed down. Jesus came to die so that you will make something out of God. It is in your making something out of God or seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness, then he will make something out of you. Jesus did not die. So that you will enjoy life. Jesus died so that you will lose your life. It is when you lose your life, then you and find his own life, you can begin to live. A generation of fathers that is trying to help you to enjoy this life. That worldly people and unbelievers, this life that's going to be burnt up by fire instead of helping you to lose your life and find his life is killing passing a faith that chastisement cannot penetrate that's condemnation because if you will not be chastened of the lord you will be condemned with the world are you listening to me now i pray if Ten people only in this place can be pricked to begin a search for God and deny or defy the code 
from the fathers in this place listening to me and I can see many hundreds here if 10 then I know that I have had more than a breakthrough that means I know the coding it will take somebody who has been yearning for something deeper it will take somebody who has been yearning for something of God that they haven't seen I was like that I was a day in 1992 I've been to many places. I've been around. But I was looking for something. I didn't know what it is. But around 2008, God began to stir the waters of my heart. And I thank God for his mercy. I pray that grace can come upon you. Because we are going to pray. Tomorrow I'm going to take you into places. We have to find the ancient pathways back to God. We have to find them. We have to find the eternal roots. They are blocked to this generation. This generation is moving around, moving around. There are ancient pathways. There are eternal roots by which we can retrace God again. Enoch was one of those people. I'm jumping the gun. That will be for tomorrow. Enoch was one of those people. Who found his way until your generation and I won't say when I say your generation I'm talking about a remnant in your generation I want to ask you are you part of that remnant are you part of that generation yes, sir. are you sure yes, sir. you are part of the generation that's going to to retrace your steps yes, sir. are you listening to this so there's another generation, there's another code passing down to this generation, making this generation religious and legalistic. So you have a group that are now being raised by fathers anointed with Old Testament oil. You see, in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6, the Bible says, God is our sufficiency. Who has made us able ministers of the New Testament. They have brought you back. They have brought you back. I said something that day. And I say it again. A lot of what we are hearing out. Fall down and die. Killing all kinds of people left and right. One lady came to my office years ago. She was looking for a job in an office. And in the course of our discussion... She had told me that the other person looking for the job is a Christian too. But her case is different. She says that I should pray for her. Anybody that wants to take her for her job must fall down and die. So I asked that, but her pastor is also praying the same thing probably in her church. That anybody want to take the job should fall down and die. So it is whose anointing is bigger now. This is the witchcraft that has entered the church. You don't know that that is witchcraft? Go and read Galatians. There's witchcraft in the church. And it is brought from the mouth of pastors. It says, who has bewitched you, O you Galatians? Who is bringing these doctrines of legalism back to you? To tie your souls down. You have to find your way out. Oh. And before this conference is over, you must navigate out. And we must find God. Before this conference is over, we must have gotten a blueprint, a roadmap, a compass on how we are going to find God. For Moses says, if you shall seek the Lord your God with all your heart, those that are going to escape are going to be the ones that can find God. The Bible says there is a generation that seeks their God in Psalms and chapter 24. He says, and this is the generation that seeks their God. I'll tell you about that generation. You... It's no longer any time. Your generation cannot survive by meat of the fathers anymore. They are still meat. Do you know that the manna, when he stayed for more than one day, maggots start to take, eat it all. It's maggot infested meat that is circulating mostly. And you are eating it. Poison. Your intestines are rotting and you don't know. Until one day you will die. And you say, Whoo, where have I been? No chastisement. Bastard's generation. So God wants us. He tells us 
he has to chastise, chastise us. I read First Corinthians, and if you remember, before even 11, 31, 32, you had talked about the reason why some of you are dying in the church. Some of you are sick. Because you are not discerning the body and blood. See, forget about the emptiness they tell you, body of Christ means bring uh, ribina and bring uh, bread, and then you eat bread and ribina, you are healed. It's a lie. Bible says, because you didn't descend the body and blood, some of you are sick and die. What's the body? That I might conform to your suffering. What is the blood? It's the, it's the cup. Jesus said, can you drink the cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? He said, but don't worry, you will drink it. That's what he said. Matthew 20. When we take the cup, it's not necessarily that the uh, drink that is inside. Yes, it is a drink, but not necessarily. It is the cup of his blood. The cup of his suffering. And that's what Paul is talking about. I want to fellowship with your suffering. I want to conform to your death. Do you know that the second you became a Christian is a call to conform to the death of Christ? That means it's a call to carry a cross. Because Jesus, when Peter called him and said, Jesus, remember Jesus told Peter? He said, Peter, and ask all the disciples, who do men say I am? That's Matthew 16. He said, some say you are Elijah, some say you are this and that. But Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And what did Jesus say? Flesh and blood has not revealed it to you. That same Matthew 16. Just look at the next few verses. The next few verses, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. That's what happened. Just in a few verses after that. Flesh and blood has not revealed to you. Count a few verses behind. Same Peter, get it behind me, Satan. Why? Because after he said so, Jesus said, All right, let me now reveal to you, I'm going to die in Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be killed. And Peter said, No, we're not going to allow it. We can't allow it. We love you too much. Is that not what's happening in the church today? It's true now. In the church, we love you too much. We want you to be healed. It doesn't matter whether you go and divorce. It doesn't matter whether you do anything. All I'm interested in your pastor. I went to a pastor's church one day and I saw his vision statement. That if you come to this church, our mission statement is to make you great, is to make you whole, is to make you healed, is to make you everything. And the man was coming, calling me for prayer to please come and lead me. I've been watching some of your stuff. I said, already. I'm that blunt. I'm that blunt. I told him already, just looking at your mission statement, you are not pastoring a church. There's a witchcraft coven here. It's a witchcraft coven. He has repented. I'm not kidding you. I went to a lady's house and she took me to come and pray for all her houses. She's just bought new houses. Well, when we were all there, very wealthy woman. Very well. When we were there, she started talking about her new house in this big area the other one she bought here so then she asked me to please just share something and pray we were about 8 or 10 of us I don't know 6 of us in the, our living room and I said to her going by everything I know from the scriptures you are a candidate of hell if we are not going to say the truth it's true She's just, it's mammon that's running her life. You can't serve God and mammon at the same time. Let us call a spade a spade. If we don't do that, we will not judge. The Bible says we must judge ourselves. I came with judgment today. Why? So that your souls can be saved. I came so that you will rejoice at the end of the day. I came so that you will be part of the remnant that will escape the judgment of the bastards. If you can hear my voice and keep and find out whether these things are truth, you will escape the judgment of the bastards. That code will be broken over your life. You will be as the few in Sardis that will no longer defile their garment. For you will navigate your way back and you will retrace and begin to find and begin to seek and begin to intermeddle with all wisdom to locate the ancient land paths and the ancient paths that lead back to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Whom he loves, he chastens. 
I will be just begin to round up before I start to pray with you. Because we have a few more sessions tomorrow. When they said three just now, were you unhappy? <laughs> I told you, you see, I'm so honest that I came up here. I didn't even greet them. I didn't greet the pastors that invited me. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Because the burden was so strong. I told you, you will not be laughing with me at the end of the day. As you are laughing now, enjoy the laughter. You won't laugh tomorrow. <laughs> but you will laugh in heaven. Yeah. As a result of the things you will hear. Yeah. You will laugh in heaven. Yeah. Forever and ever. Yeah. We have to navigate our way back. Mm. I'm telling you by prophecy and by the word of God they have almost checkmated this generation with emptiness, with dead messages and like a brother here said they have set the affections of this generation on the things that are beneath you cannot make it that way most, many people now this generation is so used to church we know the, all the language we know all the songs and some of you are sitting here looking at me you know what I'm talking about you were born in church. I counsel with young people. Many of the people I have counseled with, younger ones, their parents are no example to them at all. But they go to church. So they've grown up seeing duplicity. Grown up seeing hypocrisy. They themselves have become masters of greater hypocrisy. Because that's what they were used to. That's what they have grown up with. Listen, today we have everywhere churches on every street where our churches, at least there are four or five churches on that short street. Yet, we have so many millionaires and so many whatever we have, but the wickedness that still comes out from the church is too much. The lying, the cheating, materialism, how many of you here today, if you go into a company and you have the opportunity to make 50 million naira and nobody will ever catch you, but dishonestly, how many will turn their back and say no? It's with mouth. It is with mouth. I remember the day you phoned me and you called me, you said, there was some job your company did and something to do with a million naira out there about. And you heard my voice. I was saying to them, it's easy to abuse the politicians in Abuja. There's billionaires, Stephen billionaires. If you see half of what they are saying, you will do worse. Why? Because you don't have the faith that can help you resist it. They have not fed you with it. That faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. It's a sanctifying faith. It's missing in our generation. You cannot resist that kind of covetousness by hearing the type of messages you are hearing. Therefore, you can never please God. You can never... Uh, uh, God can't chasten you. He can't correct you. He can't mold you. He can't move you in the direction of people who will walk on the highway of holiness and find their way to him. Hallelujah. Yeah. I thought I was just going to prophesy. And let me keep it as a prophecy for now. Let me begin just to round up here and say... Ask yourself big questions today. Churches everywhere. Is the reality of God that potent? I will ask you that tomorrow. Let's ask ourselves honest. Listen. One of the things I wish will happen for you. And I pray will happen. Is that by the time you are leaving this conference. If all that happens. You are agitated in your spirit. To begin to ask questions and go and seek God. You are in the right place. Because you are blessed from that. Bible says blessed are they. Who hunger and thirst. You are already blessed. For they shall be filled. The feeling is the ultimate blessing. But the blessing begins when you start hungry. If that hunger is sparked by this conference. By all the things you will hear from all the different speakers. Then you are blessed. Then you are blessed. Hallelujah. 
Because as you look around you, you will have to ask pertinent questions. Very hard questions. And I won't, I won't start that. I will start asking you those questions tomorrow. Like I said, I just sense a very prophetic thing here. And today, I want us to pray. I want us to cry to God. For this generation, two simple prayer points. The umbilical cord. The poisoned umbilical cord. The corrupted cord. This is a demonic word. Bible, remember, Bible talks of doctrines of devils. Let me tell you something. There's a prophet called Micaiah, as I round up. And Micaiah was asked by Joseph and Ahab, tell us if we go, whether we'll win this war. He wanted to tell them what they wanted to hear. Jehovah begged him, don't tell me the correct thing. He said, but you people like to hear what you want to hear. And the big prophets were there. He came, he was the leader of 400 prophets. So, Micaiah said, when you go, you people will die. I saw in heaven that there was a council in heaven. And in that council, Mind you, there are 400 other prophets. Big boys. All those prophets were big boys. My, my, my Kaya is a small boy. They brought him from one dungeon village. These ones were city pastors. Big boys. They had already told the king, go, you are going to win. He said, my, my, my Kaya said, I saw something different too. As you are prophesying peace and safety, I'm seeing a bastard generation. No? As you are prophesying peace and safety, I saw demon spirits and they came to God and they said we are going to go and deceive the prophets and we will put a lying spirit upon the mouth of all the prophets. Immediately the chief prophet just slapped him. Why? How dare you? How do you what are you talking about? He said, well, we will see on that day. The only difference, if they slap me as much as they want, the difference is that Ahab died on the battlefield. But if this generation is not delivered, they will die for all eternity. That's too dangerous. Save yourself. I'm going to repeat it. Save yourself from this untoward generation. That was Peter's warning. Save yourself from this untoward generation. Your eyes must begin to be open. You must learn the path away of God. And I know that that's what this conference will do for you. And you can see the different things line up for you from different ministers. You must learn to navigate. I want you to start to pray. Everybody, just as the pastor led us earlier on. Number one. That the codes. Every code of hell fashioned against my generation my life so that I will not be able to find God you know what to do you are praying like your life doesn't matter some of you are praying like you don't really mean what is happening some of you are I don't know whether the sense of urgency has come in. Because if it has, I want to see some wailers in the house. I want to see somebody who can wail. What is at stake is not a game. Bible says if we will not judge ourselves. So nobody should say, Pastor Mazino, you are judging. You are judgmental. I am judgmental. He says we must judge ourselves. So that we will not be condemned with the world. We must ask ourselves pertinent question. Is this the church that Jesus died for? The faith that is being passed from the fathers to you. Can it bring chastisement upon you? Or will it make you into an Esau and a bastard? Lord God. We are asking you to break codes. Codes that prevent us. Codes that lock us down. Codes that blind us. Demonic codes that have found their way into the church. Found their way to lock down God's people. I 
I want to see about 20 or so intercessors come out here. Intercessors, come and hold the horns of the altar and cry to the Lord. Intercessor, if you're an intercessor and you have a burden in your heart, come and pray for this generation. Come out here quickly, 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 quickly. Come and help us cry. God, God, merciful God, come and cry to the Lord. Come and wail. Dearly beloved, what I have seen is not a joke. I didn't come to laugh and I didn't come to lie either. Oh God, if you will not have mercy, this generation cannot be spared. Awaken this generation from all the blindness of bastardhood. Awaken this generation from its captivity of bastardhood. In the name of Jesus, lift up your mouth and pray. Kataye kelebo sonda ya, borodo dete la dolia talia. Have mercy, Jehovah. Have mercy. We, your children, cry. Have mercy, George. Us, oh God. Chasing us, oh God. Chasing us. Chasing us. Chasing us. Chasing us. Correct us. Transform us. That we might not be condemned with the world. Kelaboliatana. I want you to pray. Pray. Let some bodies be lifted from your belly. I want us to pray. Let's make contact with the Holy Ghost. Radunanataya. Who is able to spare? Show mercy. Show mercy. Save my generation. Deliver my generation. Polia, 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 In Jesus' mighty name. We're going to take another point. Still part of this prayer point. Because the Bible says that in the book there were judges, many judges. After them, Samuel left the scene. After Joshua. Then came the judges. Hallelujah. And the mystery of these judges, they were like pastors, shepherds of Israel. But the paradox of the judges, as many of them as came, didn't really turn the hearts of Israel back to God. It didn't turn the hearts of Israel. This is the paradox. It's the same paradox today. Churches everywhere. But few people are really seeking God. 
I'm not saying that there are not many people in church. Many of us are in church. You will find out what it means to seek God. Few people are seeking God. You will find out what it means. There are pathways back to God and you will find out whether it has been downloaded to our generation or whether we are lost roaming in the wilderness as it were. That is why after the judges, the book of Samuel, it begins with, or it, it starts the first few chapters, I think it's with chapter 3 or so, it starts by saying, and the word of the Lord was scarce, and there were no open visions. In other words, there was no real communication between God and man. It was, it had, God had left. They didn't know, see, the judges, they were just doing what they were doing. But the word of God was scarce. Do you know there's preaching everywhere, but the word of God is scarce? Mm. There are churches, you just need to put on the television. Try on the television. And you will find out that most of the churches on there now are no different from motivational centers. Rudimentary centers, teaching us the rudiments of this world. Self-promoting centers. That cannot take us back to God. Are not even interested. Brethren, look at this mystery. Saul came to power. And throughout the duration of his tenure as king. He forgot that. The Ark of Covenant has been captured. He didn't care. The Ark had been captured by the Philistines. Remember. In Samuel chapter 4. And the daughter of Eli's. Eli's daughter-in-law, after, after she gave birth, she named the child Ichabod because the glory of God had departed. But shortly after that, Samuel is, uh, Saul is made king. For one second, he did not care. He just continued to do as he liked until David came. The first thing David does as king, we must go and get the Ark of God's Covenant because the glory of God is not here. Do you know that the fact that glory of God is not here doesn't mean angels are not helping? God sends his reign on everybody. The good and the bad. Bible says they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness. And he gave them their heart's desire, but he sent leanness to their soul. Don't think that you are having financial breakthrough means that you are blessed by God. It does means nothing. This is a generation, there is so much leanness. We must be delivered from it. This leanness, this blindness, we must be dealing. The word of the Lord was scarce. I tell you again, we're in those days. Preaching is going on everywhere. But the true word of God. Let me tell you one of the signs of the word of God. Your heart will burn. Wherever Jesus is, your heart will burn. You will be on fire. It will make you want to go for all of God. It will make you hate the things of this world so that you can find him. It will make you sell all so that you can buy the treasure of him. The true word of God. He says, go. He said to this Laodicean church, go and buy of me try gold that is tried of fire. Then wash your Linen. And that is pure word. That's what it means. Pure truth. This generation, I found out the mystery of her bondage or our bondage in this time. Is that advice God gave to the Laodicean church? Buy of me pure gold. He was telling them, you people are lukewarm. You people, I'm going to spew out of my mouth. I'm standing at the door of your heart. I'm knocking. You think you are rich, but you are wretched. You are blind. And you are dancing in church. You are singing in church, but you are being fathered by the devil. Laodicea, I'm not talking of Jews now. I'm talking of Laodicea. I'm talking of New Testament church. Fathered by the devil. Beware. Be very careful. We will pray. This is very important. Stay in part number one prayer. Oh God. Open our eyes. 
that we can find the truth that is scarce in this time. The Bible says, in this dry and desert land, where there's no water, I'm going to seek you, I'm going to find you. I want you to pray for yourself. That God will cause your eyes to begin to locate truth. <laughs> this prayer point will mean something to you when you begin to locate it. Your eyes will receive an anointing this moment. An anointing that will be attracted to truth, that will discover truth, that we locate truth, that we identify truth, and that we walk with truth. Shaya Bakala. Intercessors, please cry. One of the secrets to decoding the lockdown is the key of truth. Let that key be released. Let a remnant, let a remnant discover that key. Let their eyes see that key. Find that key in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to take one more prayer point and then call it a day. We have a lot to discuss tomorrow. And as we take this prayer point, be expectant. Your world is going to turn around. I will tell you what will happen. Some of you, there's going to be war between you and your current pastors and churches. God is going to come. We're going to ask him to cut off every poisonous umbilical cord. Do you know when a mother and a baby, they're connected and there's something poisonous in the mother, it will be entering the baby. It will be killing the baby. That's why some people are children born deformed and all kinds of things. If the mother was ingesting things, taking medications or drugs or alcohol or some poisonous substances, it starts entering the baby, damaging his brain young, damaging organs young. This is what we are talking about. This is the deliverance we must have from dangerous fathers. The umbilical, there's no, see, you are going to be judged by yourself. You will not be judged with another man. Jonathan went to die with his father, even though he knew that God was not with his father. Do not form any bond, emotional bond with anybody. Your bond is with Jesus Christ. Nobody owns you. Nobody must control you. Nobody died for you. You are not anybody's sheep. I do not control it. Nobody is my sheep. sheep. All are Christ's sheep. And my sheep hear my voice. You are to hear nobody else's voice for him. As I'm speaking, if I am speaking of myself, you are not to hear it. If I'm speaking and it's not of Christ, you are not to hear it. The only voice, if you are the true sheep of Christ, you are listening for Christ in my speech. That's all you are looking for. So you are owned by nobody. Any umbilical cord that has been feeding you, that has been poisoning you, is cut off and they are poison neutralized in the name of Jesus every umbilical cord cut off open your mouth and pray I cut myself off from every umbilical cord that is not truth that is not of truth in the name of Jesus Every poisonous umbilical cord, void of the truth of God. Watch it. Watch what is happening. Watch what is happening. Somebody is here. You are in your father's church. 
he's not speaking truth the lord is going to pull you out of that place he's planting you somewhere else somebody's here you have been listening to an emptiness but the jealousy of the lord is upon you as a man unto his bride and by virtue of our tears before the lord the lord is going to recalibrate your life he's going to send somebody to you he's going to lead you to somebody to somewhere ancient past yes 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 deliver our generation oh god from this wickedness cut us off from every umbilical cord of satan every lie nakalete boraska labados boraska labados doria kalaba we trust that the lord has been speaking to you through this message our prayer is that he will move mightily and is moving mightily in your life we would like to hear from you pray with you and share your testimonies with you you can reach us on 0809 testify or call our church office on 01 2903 you can also send us an email on info at tbrchurch.org or better still join us at one of our services on sunday by 9 a.m at 13a Ikorodu Road, Maryland, Lagos, Nigeria. God bless you.